Tanner, Jim, Manny, thanks for joining us this morning. So we're here to talk about innovation in the new health economy, and the new health economy characterized by the changing landscape in the U.S. with non-traditional players like Walmart getting into the delivery of care, companies like Google developing medical devices, for example, like their contact that detects blood sugar. And so let's start our conversation this morning for the benefit of the audience and tell me a little bit about how in your organizations, because you're all in early stage companies at the moment, how you're thinking about innovation. How do you define innovation in your organization and how do you measure innovation? Tanner, let's, let's start with you. Sure. We, we think about innovation in a fairly broad sense. Uh, actually, total innovation is one of our core values. So not only do we want to bring new products to help treat patients uh, to market, and we measure that through, but just the process by itself, which is a combination of speed through the process and the quality of the process. Are we rigorously approaching how we move those products through our internal processes? We then evaluate those opportunities through the uh, benefit to the end user, the patient, as well as the financial opportunity for us and what we think of as being the broader speed to market. Uh, for us as a startup where you know, we're burning through cash because we're pre-revenue, the most important thing for us is that we move through this at a fast pace, that we identify those things that might be uh, strong contributors to the bottom line ultimately, mm -hmm. quickly, mm -hmm. and that we let everything else fall to the side uh, as fast as we can. Good. Now, Jim, you're going to have a little different perspective, right, of having built uh, some fairly large organizations. Yes. So tell me how you've handled and how you think about innovation today. I would break it up into three key points. The first is, what's the need? We, we look at the market and is there really a need for this product? Because we all know some of the trials and tribulations you get through the regulatory processes today. So what is the need? The second, and I've learned this from day one, is you have to have good science. I think we all believe in our science, but at the end of the day, we really have to have a sanity check on is it good science and can you translate that good science? And then the third very important point is what's the value proposition? Who, who's going to benefit from this? Do, do you have a nice complement of both practitioner and patient? If one is out of balance, that I think is going to cause a problem on innovation because if it doesn't get accepted by the practitioner, you're not going to be able to translate that to the patient or vice versa. If the patient doesn't see a value and we get to the payer system, you've got those challenges. So I would say need, I would say good science and value. Good, three good themes. Uh, Manny, how about you? You've also had some success in the industry building and helping to found some fairly prominent companies. How are you thinking about innovation and measuring it today? Again, the need. You've got to find, is there a need? I mean, we can go up down a lot of paths with a variety of technologies, but if there's no need, forget about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's as simple as that. Uh, when we started working on pacemakers, uh, the average pacemaker would last, you know, 18 months, 24 months, okay? They were big and bulky, like the size of a hockey puck, but we had to come and design a pacemaker that would last longer. And once you do that, then everyone knows there's a need for that, okay? Sometimes you have to introduce a need, not just, well, we got pacemakers. Yeah, but they're only 18 to 24 months, and we introduced pacemakers that would last 20, 30 years. When we did the St. Jude Valve, I'm the former CEO, I was announced as the CEO, but I'm the former CEO of St. Jude. Again, we had valves, tons of valves. We don't need a valve. Yes, you do, because the ones that you have right now are causing strokes, you know, clogging up, breaking, the whole thing. So we developed the St. Jude Valve, okay? And we did it again and again. Our present technology that we're doing, bypass surgery. There's nothing mm. in surgery now, but there is a need to make a vein last longer, and that's what we're doing, so that you don't have to do that surgery again and again. Mm -hmm. So you, you create sometimes a need. It may, it's there, but no one identifies it. Now, the other challenges that you mentioned about acceptance and costs and things like that, for a very, very, very small company, that has to come second. You first have to develop your technology, believe in the technology, promote that technology, and then say, okay, how are we going to sell it? We'll get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me maybe uh, continue on that theme of acceptance, right? Let's assume the need, the technology to address the need is there. In the new health economy, again, companies like Walmart saying we're going to be a deliverer of care. Companies like Google with their contact. 
uh, companies like Samsung with their developing to go into their mobile device, Apple with its recent announcement. We have this uh, consumer-focused uh, initiative to drive access to care and improve adherence to care. How are you starting to assess and evaluate that consumer influence on the design or the adoption acceptance of the technology earlier in the process or at different stages of the process? Maybe we'll start with you, Jim, and then go to Manny, given your experience, and then come back to you, Tanner. Well, uh, my area of expertise is ophthalmology, so we've had a, actually, you talk about Google, I'll mention that briefly in a second, but um, we've actually had a programs now across the globe where the actual patient can be involved in paying for a higher technology. Um, I see my good friend Andy Stapers out there who, we, we innovated a program called Patient Shared Billing in the United States where you can get a traditional intraocular lens, but if you want a higher type of technology, the patient has to pay for it. So we've started now looking at technologies where the actual patient will pay for that higher end technology. We're not saying it's, it's superior, it provides a better benefit because you can't have that challenge of the haves and have nots. But we've involved the consumer a lot earlier because if you think about eye diseases, people are challenged with presbyopia, glaucoma, retinal problems. Now I don't want to, uh, let me just bridge to the, to the Google point because Google is obviously involved uh, with their contact lens. I would just sit there and say that the thing I found most interesting about this whole Google event because they did it with one of our uh, peers, Alcon, is that they spend a billion dollars in healthcare. I don't know if most of us knew that. They spend a billion dollars in healthcare. And just a quick moment is they, they looked at one of our technologies and said, how long did it take you to develop it? And we said six years. And they said, we can probably do it in two. And the reason I think they did it in two was not that they were smarter. They actually involved the consumer. And to your point, they understood the need of the consumer. And they got rid of some of the stuff that we thought the practitioners would love. But they averted that and went right to the consumer end of it. And mm -hmm. so I would tell you that I think people are starting to identify the consumer in the end all process much earlier now. Mm -hmm. How about you, Manny? Well, you know, as we take a look at the, uh, the social media and the players in that, we, of course, would love to participate in that, but, but again, we specialize in those products dealing with surgeons. Mm -hmm. I don't even deal with cardiologists too often, but just surgeons. And it's always the highest, most difficult technology. It's hard to talk to, a, to an individual, to a consumer, and say, we're going to open up your heart, we're going to do this and that, we're going to take a vein out of your leg and do all that. You, you lost them already, okay? <laughs> Uh, so we have to concentrate on the, on the surgeon. Uh, the best that we can do at this time is to give all our technology in, uh, in a website or, or give them a stick with all the videos and things like that to teach. But that's who we continue to teach. It's the surgeon, the customer. We're also now starting to concentrate on the payer, the, the administration hospital. Okay, now that we've proven this technology works, this is where we have to go, okay? But it'll be a, a few years before I can approach the consumer market and say, by the way, you know, you need a new way of having your heart surgery done. You know, it's going to be a while. <laughs> you're, you're a little in between, Tanner. You've got a technology that really is a quality of life improvement for certain patient populations. How are you bringing that to fore? I think the, the consumer is a critical aspect of what we're trying to do. Uh, we're moving into a therapeutic space that's historically dominated by drugs and pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical treatments. And as we're moving from what would be, say, a, a pill into what would be a surgical op option for patients, part of making sure that we have the right marketing messages as we move through the PMA FDA process, which takes a long time, obviously, as everyone's aware, uh, we want to make sure that we pregame those messages today in a way that will actually allow those consumers to make the decision to do what we'd like them to do. Because mm -hmm. uh, we know that it has a uh, great op opportunity for quality of life improvement. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've already started talking to the consumer up front, and we think that that's a, a critical aspect of what we're trying to do uh, as we try to change the continuum of care ultimately. Jim, you made a, a good point in this new health economy, these new entrants coming in like Google, collapsing the development cycle from six years to two. Mm -hmm. How is that uh, affecting your plans and your thinking around product development, product uh, introduction into the market, as well as for you, Tanner and Manny? Do you see these new entrants putting pressure on your organizations and the speed with which you have to drive innovation 
and engage that consumer earlier, potentially, in the process? Well, I think it's very good. Uh, you know, uh, I, running a large company, and now we, we have a multiple adversant uh, healthcare companies, uh, we've taken the principle of fail fast, and that is a process that large companies have a problem with. Uh, you know, hang on to that last R&D project, keep pushing it, keep spending on it. Our companies, which are fairly small, you got to fail fast. So I love the principle of first identifying what's going to be the amount of time and how are you going to measure that success. And we find it a lot earlier in the process to identify what are going to be the pitfalls. We, we, we try not to be negative, but what are going to be the issues that we're going to fail, uh, fail at and how are we going to overcome them? And then if we don't think we got to overcome them, we got to kill the project because we just don't have the time or the expense. And I think that's why you see a lot of large companies here today, and I was one of those, where we had little R and mostly D, and we look for the innovators that are present here to be our R. Mm -hmm. And I think that's still a great uh, system uh, that is involved here in our med tech industry that the little companies can fail fast and then once they succeed, we have the large strategics who can uh, take, a, take us to the next level. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think that's well said. I think time is our most precious commodity, very closely related to funding, which is critical for everybody, obviously. Uh, but we want to fail fast as we move through the process. We actually, as we're developing our innovation process, are looking outside of the medical device space to find the best practices, to look at how they engage the consumer early, to figure out how we can treat doctors like consumers, payers, uh, procurement folks as we look at the, the landscape and obviously my background is not steeped in medical device but what you see is a landscape that is continually changing almost like uh, you're sort of standing on a moving table and we're trying to figure it out at the same time and there's some other good best practices that mm -hmm. we're trying to utilize. Mm -hmm. How about you, Manny? Kips Bay, you've got some early stage companies. How are you? Yeah, we, we've had a that? lot of early stage companies and, and Jim saying about uh, you know cut it when you have to cut it Okay, and I, I do understand that, but it's, it's amazing that when we begin, for some reason, maybe it's me or maybe it's our people, uh, we can do it. We can do it, you know, and, it's, and it's, sometimes it takes a long, long time. I mean, I can tell you that, here, here we're talking about St. Jude before, it's a multi-billion dollar company. I remember one, one time we made 100 valves and 97 of them broke. This is in one month period of time. If you don't think I was going to shut the door, I was going to shut the door. But there were our engineers who said, no, we can do it. And in fact, one guy actually had a dream in the middle of the night, calls me up at 3 in the morning. He said, Manny, I got it. I got it. I know how we can solve the problem. I'll see you at 5. And I said, no, you're not. You're going to see me at 9 o'clock in the morning because it's a snowstorm outside. So at 9 o'clock, he's waiting there at the door, opens up the door, takes my coat off. Come on, let's go into the lab. I'll show you how to do it. And he showed me how to do it. And we made, we had, we had 15 rings or, to make the valve, and all of them worked, okay? So sometimes, even though you're saying, ah, we gotta give up, something happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the technology we're working on today, we've been working on it for seven years. We're finally getting to the point where we understand how to implant it. It works, we have some decent data coming through. There have been days when you wanted to quit. From an economics point of view, we should have quit, okay? But the desire to develop a product, products that have never been done before, products that are, people say can't be done, that tenacity you got to have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. So you're talking about cardiology and, and treatments and cures there. Uh, and we've touched on the Google example of new entrants coming in and, and offering technologies in a different way. So in the cardiology space, we've got companies like AliveCore, right, that have got a FDA approval now for uh, monitoring your heart rate, attaching it to the iPhone. We've also got Samsung and Apple with their devices having algorithms within them to monitor heart rates. Uh, how are you starting to assess potential collaborations with uh, these new entrants as you develop product and or as you look to commercialize successfully these products? You see, as soon as I get off this chair and Jim gets off the chair, I'm going to grab him and say, who is the contact at Google? Because you always can take any product and apply a better way, in this case monitoring, mm -hmm. a better way of assessing if it's working or not, things like that. And, uh, and we don't have the technology. I'm sure we could develop it, but it would take forever and we don't right. know. Where they have a team who are anxious to develop and work some sort of, you know. 
And I, for example, on our device, you put it in the body and then you have to evaluate, is it working? Mm -hmm. Presently, the only way to do that is by a, an expensive angiogram, and which includes some possibility of morbidity and things like that. But wouldn't it be nice if, hmm, it's working? Right. You know, simple right. as that. And, and I think that's something that I would like you to help yeah, me on. I'm glad he yeah. thinks my heart's working. That's yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Most people don't think my heart works, but uh, my heart is working. Good. I, let me, if I can just build one thing on that. We're, sure. we're doing a build to buy model now, where we're actually going into a strategic a lot earlier and saying, since we have the expertise in a certain science, you, we'll build to buy. You, you pay us. Mm -hmm. hit milestones early on, mm -hmm. and if we continue to hit that milestones, we obviously know an exit. Right. They obviously have a, a technology that has the expertise. So that's a new model we're doing with strategics, which is a little different than in the past where you waited till you built it and then you sold, sold it. We're now doing build the buys mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from that, which is new for our industry. Sure. Very interesting. How about you, Tanner? Uh, you know, it's interesting. We, we're, I, I love the build to buy model, obviously. I mean, who in an early stage company doesn't like the idea that there's a guaranteed exit at some point in the future? Um, we're a little bit more below the radar. It's sort of hard to find more about us, but we've already started to have some of those conversations. You know, it, I love the idea of the monitoring. I think if, if we could find a way, and I would like to do that earlier to think about the quality of life aspects of it, mm -hmm. uh, what I see is that as consumers become more involved in their health care, as they become more focused on learning about the various options out there, we'll see them being better consumers. And back to the point about the good science, you have to have great science. They'll be consumers who are looking at the science, trying to, with their doctors, trying to figure out what to do next. And I only see that helping as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Let's continue on this uh, collaboration theme for a minute. We've got, uh, again, retailers like Walmart, Walgreens, CVS, really expanding aggressively into the provision of primary care. Walgreens has even gone so far as to set up a person to run their clinical research organization. Have you started to incorporate that thinking as potential partners or collaborators early in the process, maybe for payers or in the development process, to go to these non-traditional providers of care to say, how can we help you in this environment that we're confronting today? Tanner? You know, I think <clears throat> just given where we are in our life cycle, we're in the process of really planning that aspect of where we go next, and they're definitely included. I think you know the payer piece is a, is a large piece for us as we think about what payers would like to see. We've already had some conversations with CMS, though this, the studies for FDA are, FDA are great. We're sort of, you get to cherry pick all the population, and it's very uniform in nature. So we do see that as an opportunity. We haven't actually engaged in those conversations yet, but they're definitely on the list. Mm -hmm. You, I would sit there and say that, just to build on it, the payers, uh, because we are looking at potentially opting out of not having our products reimbursed in a couple, mm -hmm. of, ca couple of the businesses. We're, we're looking to check the box and saying, you know what, we don't want to be reimbursed, we'll do patient pay, but obviously that restricts your market, but it does potentially increase your value. And one of the other things we were talking about a little earlier today is another area that's a challenge for us is the combination of drug and device. So that is becoming more prevalent. We, we specialize in retina, age-related macular degeneration, and the question now is, is it a device or is it a drug, as we were talking about? And that is something we never had to have a discussion in earlier, because who do you go to? Do you go to the drug group, or do you go to the device group, or they tell you who you're gonna go to? And that's a challenge, because if you're traditionally a, a device company, mm -hmm. you don't have the expertise of a pharma group. So we're having to get those people in a lot earlier than we ever did before. Mm -hmm. You, when you're talking about uh, companies like Walmart, it, that's a little too early for us. We still have to go through the process of getting our device uh, uh, approved here in the United States. We're right now in the middle of a feasibility trial uh, that will still take us some time. But I got to tell you that I would never have thought of bringing into a conversation Walmart. <laughs> Great company, but I'm sorry, not, not at this meeting, not at this stage, not at, you know, in the medical, you know, doc. You, you got to go to Walmart, or Walmart is going to go to you. You know, I mean, it's new, but we all, all of us, have to think the new. This is a new world. Okay. I mean, absolutely a new world. I never would have thought of Walmart, but here I am talking about Walmart. Right, right. 
yeah. and potentially reimbursing you based on outcomes. So right. Right. how do you start exactly. to think about defining value for your particular product or device in that kind of environment when Walmart's a potential customer and we know how they operate when it comes to the price of a pair of socks. Yeah, right. So how are you, how are you thinking about that, man? Well, you know, we do have the challenge that, that we have to prove that our device adds value, in mm -hmm. other words, and they do it in terms of extended days of the patient's life. Never forget about the stay in the hospital, mm -hmm. but how much, how much, the, what's the value of one extra year of a patient's life? And you have to kind of show that. And right now we're looking at uh, uh, some recent data that we have received on uh, our device after six years. Okay, it's not, it, it's still not, uh, we can't make a real claim on it yet, but our early indications are is that our device, I can show a doctor, works after six years. And many doctors will say to you, Manny, I've never seen any data at six years, but we have that already and uh, we're starting to begin to talk about it. I, I'm trying to get some more patients at six years so I can talk about it you know, sensibly and more credibly and things like that. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, gonna, it's, a, it's a challenge for us because we have to then go to the payers and say, well, you see this guy, six years, all right, and there's been no re-intervention because during this normal six-year cycle of a, of a cabbage patient, uh, it's not uncommon to see him two or three times going back into the hospital, and as soon as you walk in through the door of the hospital, that's a twenty thousand dollar tab. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say one other thing. We we're talking here very U.S. oriented. Yeah, right. right. You right. know, yeah. uh, we have to think globally too mm -hmm. as we look at non-traditional approaches. And in fact, in some cases, there is one of our companies. We're not. We're never going to bring it to the U.S. We now believe that the market is far better outside the United States versus the cost is prohibitive to bring it into the U.S. And if somebody else wants to acquire, we take it. So I think we're talking a lot about, you know, the U.S. orientations, but I think a, a discerning factor now is international impact, and it's yeah. far more of a positive than it was in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think just to build on that, well, Walmart's less relevant for us until they hire surgeons, but. Uh, the health economics aspect of what we're doing as we move forward in innovation and trying to make sure that we've already thought about that so that we don't get caught outside of the United States where they're very much focused on this. And exactly. as an early stage organization, you know, the H we don't have enough data yet to answer all the HTA questions, but we have to be prepared to be able to make those arguments as we move forward and show where we're collecting that data. So as part of our clinical research program and our data collection, we are already planning to add in some of that information, which would obviously answer some of the Walmart questions and hopefully provide fantastic reimbursement. Yeah. Now, now, the challenge of all of this gathering the data to accomplish these things, there is one little part of the formula that, that we're not talking about, and that is cost. To gather that data it costs a lot of money, and for the small company, and I typically work with the micro, micro, micro companies, okay, uh, money is very critical to us, okay? And, uh, uh, and so the challenge for doing all these things is that the CEO and together with his finance person is hat in hand, knocking on the door, can we tell you about the greatest thing since sliced bread? You know, give us some money. You know, that's the, the fundraising aspect is very, very hard because now there is more and more requirements from the payer that says, show me. Okay, and uh, so that's a big challenge. Yeah. That's a yeah. very big challenge that we all face as a small company. That's a that's a good theme. Let's continue that for a moment, Jim. You're you're investing in companies, right, through mm -hmm. Versa. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you finding the fundraising environment, the ability to uh, socialize or syndicate deals uh, for these new technologies and operating in the new health economy? It's difficult. Uh, it's a lot more difficult than it was in the past, especially devices. Uh, I think we've all heard you know, over the last couple of days that this is not the market right now because of the slowness to come to the market. So it is becoming difficult. But I still will go back to those three traditional values. If you can show good science and you can show a market opportunity, um, the money will come. Uh, I, I really mean that. I think, in the, I think we fell in the flavor that we could just introduce in the past and the flow would come. You have to be very diligent. You have to have great people like the panelists up here. Uh, but I would say that it's much more difficult. 
and collaborations are going to be the way to go. We're not going to be able to do it independently anymore. We're going to have to have collaborative efforts. I'm not sure if it's Walmart and aisle 15, you'll see a pacemaker, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I do believe that you will see some of the non-traditional people uh, willing to collaborate with us early, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. early. <laughs> you know, I just, living back to my first VC conversation ever, the third question was about reimbursement. Yeah, that's, right? that's so, you know, we don't have a product. We haven't built the kit. We're looking to support the idea. We need to go through the PMA process. The third question is about reimbursement. Uh, frankly, we hadn't even thought about it yet, so it was a great learning opportunity. And we left with no money. Um, that said, it does change. The funding environment does change how we think about the world. We're obviously focused on time. We're focused on building the story. We're focused on answering those questions sooner. It comes back to the need. It comes back to the science. And I think, you know, the idea of the collaboration uh, can't be understated. I mean, it is the only way that as a small company with limited financing that you're ultimately going to get there. And I think as you look at the larger companies, they're already starting to see that. And some of those folks out there are already out there th talking to early stage companies. Uh, and I think we would rely, we might put a plan in place, right, which we're not going to fund to get there, but then we would rely on other folks to help us get there. And that's not just corporates. That could be NIH. It could be whoever. And one of the things just to build on, a lot of the large strategics now have venture arms. And actually, instead of talking to their traditional business development people, talk to their venture groups, yep. because they're much more willing to participate in that. So that's, that's something different in the last five years. Good. I think we're out of time, but uh, appreciate Tanner, Jim, Manny, you all joining us this morning and talking about innovation and the new health economy and the need to press on. Great. Thanks, Thanks Brian. so much. Thanks, Brian. Did a Thank good you. Job. Thank you, Brian.